Hey Cherubs, it's Matt. Today we're going to talk about management of dementia with behavioral disturbances, and more specifically, what are called non-pharmacological interventions and redirection. Now you're probably thinking, Aw oh man, Dr. Uechi is going to go off on another one of his rambling fits again. Non-pharma what? That phrase doesn't actually mean anything, does it? It's made up, like the vowels and amitriptyline. I want to talk about this because many people find behavioral disturbances to be the most distressing aspects of dementia. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to minimize memory loss and functional status deficits, but when your sweet little old grandma starts cussing you out and biting and kicking, any semblance of dignity and quality of life that she has goes straight out the window. Grandma, I've told you a thousand times, you can't throw feces while we're at Target. You can only do that at Kmart. Behavioral problems are a huge source of stress for families and caregivers and frequently lead to long-term institutionalization. Some studies show that 90% of demented patients will develop behavioral disturbances over the course of their illness, so this is a huge problem. Here's a scenario. You're called for a 90-year-old demented guy who's kicking and screaming in the middle of the night. What's your next step in management? Well, the answer on your board exam is going to be something vague but diligent, idealistic, and responsible. Like, perform a complete history and physical examination, or non-pharmacological interventions and redirection. You know, something that's not an antipsychotic, benzodiazepine, or physical restraint. And while intellectually you may be able to pick out the right answer, you may have some reservations in the back of your mind regarding whether this answer is actually pragmatic. After all, it's widely known that board questions are written by wizards sitting in ivory towers drinking unicorn lattes. But consider this. Change the situation to a 90-day-old male. All of a sudden, the way you approach this situation is completely different. What's on your differential for crying baby? No, you know what? You don't even need to be a healthcare professional to figure this out. Watch this. Jimmy, why do babies cry? See, this isn't hard. So you just run the list and check. Is he hungry? Diaper need changing? Lonely? And sometimes you can't figure out what's wrong, so you end up coddling him and singing him a song until he falls asleep. And then this repeats again at 4am. If your first step in management of a crying infant were to reach for an antipsychotic, you'd be in prison. But somehow this is acceptable for the elderly. I think that some of our reluctance to attempt non-pharmacological interventions and redirection stems from the fact that viable interventions aren't always feasible or obvious in the elderly. So let's go through some examples to give you some ideas. Scenario number two. My grandmother developed Alzheimer's disease and was living with my parents. My parents decided to go on vacation, and my aunt and uncle agreed to come over to watch grandma. I was in my fourth year of medical school and was living at home at the time because I am a man-child. Hey! Jimmy, why do you put that in the script? It doesn't matter if it's true. Mom! Jimmy's teasing me again! One evening, I woke up in the middle of the night because I heard my grandmother screaming. I ran to the bathroom and found her sitting on the toilet and shouting for help. Help! Help! Call the police! My aunt and my uncle explained that they had taken her to the bathroom, but she wasn't able to recognize them, so she thought that she had been kidnapped. So I approached her and attempted to console her, and I failed miserably, because quite frankly, even people without dementia don't find me easy on the eyes. Oh, great. What now? In this situation, remember, I'm at home. I don't have any meds, so even if I wanted to give her haloperidol, I can't. Do I call 911? Sure, that's an option. But I also know that my grandmother hates going to the hospital, and sending her to a place full of strangers who are going to try to draw blood from her is probably going to make her even more confused. So I made a last-ditch effort. I took out my white coat, my stethoscope, a pair of pants, and my fanciest pair of shoes, and I went back into the bathroom and said, Mrs. Kimura, how may I help you? And my grandmother looked at me and said, 
Oh, I think I'd like to go back to bed now. So we took her back to bed, and she slept for the rest of the night and was just fine. Mischief managed. My grandmother didn't recognize who I was, but she mistook me for a doctor. And in so doing, she was able to come to the conclusion that she was safe, and that's all it took to defuse the situation. Did I know that this was going to work? Nope. But the point here is that sometimes diffusing a situation requires some creativity. It really helps if you can identify a trigger for the situation, and that's what we will be discussing in the next case. Scenario number three, hospitalized elderly gentleman. Every afternoon, the patient becomes extremely agitated. Upon further investigation, it's discovered that the patient's son comes to visit every afternoon. Quick digression here. Normally, this is a good thing. We often tell family members that they should visit because they provide a source of familiarity to the patient that helps to reorient them. However, in this case, whenever the son arrives, the patient asks him, Where's my wife? And the son's reply is always, Dad, we've been over this a million times. Mom is dead. She's been dead for years. The patient becomes incensed. No, that's not true. That's a lie. You're hiding me from her. Because the two of you are having an affair. This degenerates into a shouting match, and eventually the patient's son storms off, and the patient is left screaming bloody murder. Fantastic. What's the next step in management here? Don't let the son visit? Ever? That's pretty junk, right? Hold that thought. So the next afternoon, the son comes to visit like usual. And also like usual, the patient asks, Where's my wife? And at that moment, a clever nurse swoops into the room and says, Are you looking for your wife? Let's go find her. So the nurse takes the patient for a stroll and asks him, Where did you meet your wife? Wow, Chicago? That's a beautiful city. Tell me more about Chicago. What do you like to do there? She keeps leading him on tangents, and pretty soon, they're on a completely different topic. A few minutes later, she brings him back to his room, and by this time, he's forgotten that he was looking for his wife. The son stays for a bit and leaves amicably. To drive the point home, if you can identify the trigger for someone's behaviors and come up with a creative solution, this is going to be your best option. You won't need to prescribe any dangerous medications with potential side effects, and hopefully you'll save some time, money, and grief. But what if you simply can't identify a trigger or a solution? At some point on night float, you're probably going to get a page that your 90-year-old hospitalized gentleman pulled out his IVs, pulled out his foley, punched the CNA, bit the charge nurse, and is trying to escape down the stairwell. It's two in the morning. What do you do? Stay tuned for pharmacological management of behavioral disturbances.